I'm Amy Morin, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a psychotherapist and an author, and I'm an outlier. Hey everybody, welcome to Outlier On Air. This is the podcast where we interview founders, disruptors, and mavens. As always, I'm your host, Ever Gonzalez. On today's episode, we have Amy Morin. Amy is a licensed clinical social worker and lecturer at Northeastern University. She's also an international best-selling author. Her books, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do and 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do, have been translated into 30 languages. She gave one of the most popular TEDx talks of all time with more than 6.5 million views. Her advice has been featured by media outlets around the globe, ranging from CNN in Mexico to MTV in Finland. Amy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. We're excited to have you on the show to talk about your books, your career, the ups and downs of everything that you do, and and just kind of pick your brain on the, this this mental strength topic that's I don't know. It seems like more people are talking about it nowadays. So again, we're excited to have you here. We're going to talk about that in just a sec. But before we get started, let's talk about where you're calling us from right now. Um, I'm on a boat in the Florida Keys. On a boat on the Florida. So you're not on vacation. This is where you live. Right. I live here most of the year these days. <laughs> why a boat in Florida? I, I mean, yeah, why I'm not, I guess, Maine. right? <laughs> Well, there was that. I'm from Maine originally, and now that my husband and I both work primarily from home, we were sitting in Maine in February a couple of years ago, and it was uh, below zero, dark by 4 (laughs) p.m., and we sort of said, what are we doing? We don't have to do this, and so we said, let's go do something else, so we said, let's let's go on an adventure for a while, so we decided to to come to the Florida Keys, and what better way to spend it than to be on a boat, and we can travel around, see the world, and do what we want to do, and both of us, as long as we have an internet connection, we can do our work. So, you know, a lot of people want that kind of lifestyle. There must be pros and cons to it, though. What, what, what are some of the, the difficult parts, if any, for, of this type of lifestyle that, that you're living right now? Well, one thing is it's a little tougher. It was easier to work when I lived in Maine and there, there was a blizzard outside. There was really nowhere to go and nothing to do. <laughs> but now that the, you know, the beach, the sun, the warm weather, everything's always calling. There's plenty of things you could be doing. Um, so sometimes it's a little tougher to convince myself to, to sit down and work. Um, otherwise I do a lot of traveling for speaking engagements and there's no real good way to get in and out of the Florida Keys. There's a Key West airport, but it really doesn't take you anywhere. So it definitely takes longer to travel. I usually travel out of Miami, so it takes longer to, to get to the airport and to get anywhere. So you take the good with the bad, it sounds like though, right? Nothing's going to change. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. There's plenty of, plenty of upsides. (laughs) Congratulations. That's a lifestyle that most people want that a lot of people, uh, you know, are, are working towards and, and you're doing it. So just for that alone, congratulations. That's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Now let's, let's talk about what we brought you on the show to talk about. You have two books, right? 13 things mentally strong people don't do and 13 things mentally strong parents don't do uh, as well. Two different books. We're going to uh, kind of talk about each one of them uh, separately, but before we get into that, this this is the theme is mental strength uh, uh, throughout these books, in in my opinion, and a lot of the speaking that you do. Let's define that real quick. Uh, mental strength. What does that mean to you? So it's really about the thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. There's three parts to it. So the thinking part is about thinking realistically, so that you're not overly negative, but you also don't want to walk into a situation being overly positive. And then the feeling part is saying, okay, I can be in control of my feelings rather than let my feelings control me because there's lots of skills and things you can do to manage your feelings. If you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you don't have to stay in a bad mood. You can choose to improve how you feel. And then the third part is about your behavior and it involves choosing to take positive action. No matter what kind of problems you face or situations you have in life, you can always choose to make your life or somebody else's life a little bit better. And so when you combine those three things, then you have mental strength. So it sounds like 
are people born with it? I mean, is this just like anything else where some people ha have more of it than, than others? And if so, for those of us that maybe don't, aren't born with that or don't have that, how can we in increase it? Well, I like to tell people mental strength is similar to physical strength. Nobody's born physically strong. Uh, nobody's born mentally strong, but we all have the ability to develop it. Uh, some people certainly have complicating factors. So just like somebody who maybe had a physical health issue like diabetes, it's a little more complicated to, to develop physical strength. Same can be said for mental strength. Maybe you have a, a, had a traumatic childhood. Maybe you have depression. Those things all make it a little bit more difficult, but really building mental strength is about the daily habits that you choose to do and, of course, getting rid of the bad habits that keep you stuck and the ones that are holding us back. So it's really all about what you choose to do with your time and how you choose to spend it and making it a priority. And we can all build mental strength and we always have room for improvement too. With all the speaking and, and uh, all of the people that you get to meet, do we understand it? Oh, I think people are fairly clueless. I think it's a new concept for mm -hmm. a lot of people and it a lot of people like don't it, sure. understand it. Yeah, when I, you know, and I think I didn't realize that I was a therapist for years. And so it's something that I had thought a lot about. But and then the original 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, it was an article and it resonated so much. It was read by 50 million people. And that's when it, it really became clear to me, oh, people don't really know much about mental strength and they want to know more. And over the years since then, I've had to definitely clarify a lot of things. And I think one of the biggest issues I face is people confuse acting tough with being strong. And they'll say, you know, I don't, I don't ever get upset. I don't have to worry about anything. Failure is not an option. And, it, but that's not it. It's really not, that doesn't mean that you're strong. It means you're just putting up walls and you're being defensive and you're trying to make other people think that you're tough. But being strong is about really saying, okay, I, I'm aware of my emotions. I can, I can admit my weaknesses. I can say, okay, I'm kind of scared about this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And it's more about being vulnerable and acknowledging your limitations and being okay with that. Yeah. The old definition of strength, it has changed, right? We, before I used to think of the big tough guy, no emotions, very serious, right? I can get through anything, but now it's kind of shifting a little bit. Like you mentioned, being a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more open, you know, not being afraid to to cry or say you ha you're having a, a a tough time with this or that. Um, why the change? Well, when you really think about it, what does it take more courage to admit to say no? I yeah. don't ever worry about anything, mm -hmm. or to to say to somebody, you know, I'm kind of nervous about this, or I feel that my feelings are hurt. Obviously, that takes a lot more courage. So I think we're coming around to the idea that suppressing things and pretending like nothing bothers you actually doesn't come from a place of courage. It takes a lot more bravery to acknowledge, yeah, I'm kind of, this is how I'm feeling or this is what I want to do but I'm scared to do it. Asking for help, all of those things take a lot of courage. It feels like we're in that transition right now, right? So what is this going to look like in 10 years or so, 10, 20 years? What, what are we going to, what is mental strength and, and the, the strong individual going to look like, act like, be like? Well, I hope it will open more doors for people just being willing to acknowledge their feelings, to have tough conversations with people, to be able to say, okay, this is bothering me. But at the same time, knowing that because somebody's behavior, because you find it annoying, doesn't mean the other person has to stop. Because I think I run into that a lot too, where somebody will say, I can't stand this, so that person needs to change their behavior. But that's not it at all. Part of mental strength is saying you can speak up to that person, but that person doesn't need to stop. You can figure out what can you do to control your own behavior and taking personal responsibility. I think there's a, there's a fear right now that somehow mental strength is stigmatizing. I just got actually hired a little while ago by a, a major company who wanted me to talk to their employees about mental strength. But then their legal team and their diversity team and their PR rep said, could you talk a little bit about grief instead of mental strength? We're afraid the term mental strength might be offensive to some oh, people. Oh, shoot, really? And Right. And I think that that's really sad because mental strength, it just like if we didn't educate people about healthy eating habits and the importance of exercise, none of us would know how do you take care of your physical health. The same is said with mental strength and mental health. There's all things you can proactively do. It doesn't mean you're always going to prevent mental health problems, just like exercise and a good diet won't all prevent all physical health problems, but you still can choose to make a difference. And so 
uh, that's something that I'm combating. Some people are really worried that if we talk about mental strength, somehow it implies that people who have depression have a weakness. But that's not it at all. Just like if you take care of your health and you still develop cancer or diabetes, it doesn't mean that you it's your fault. Sometimes we just get ill for one reason or another, and it's to no fault of our own. Sir, are you seeing that the younger generation, right, the, those that are coming up, are a little bit more open to that? It, it feels like still the – you know, the more of the corporate, older, right, the, those guys and gals that have been in charge for, for quite a while, that's where it gets sticky and that's where things like this happen, where, where they don't want you coming in there talking about men's strength. Um, is it a generational thing right now still? I don't think it is. I think, um, you know, it's a variety. I've gotten hired by a lot of companies of people who are 70 and over, and we're talking about men who are wearing, you know, the suits to work and nothing else, and they've completely embraced this. Versus, uh, you know, the company I'm talking about is a really young company, oh. and they were worried that mental strength was offensive. So I think it really, uh, really depends. Um, um, sometimes I'm surprised by people who, who really embrace it, but other times I'll find that somebody will say, well, you know, maybe that's not a good idea to talk about. But I've had uh, big places like the National Alliance on Mental Illness. They definitely help uh, share my stuff on social media. So I feel like it's, it's out there, and hopefully it will become more mainstream after a while. Well, let's let's hope that it continues right in this direction. We we need to be talking a lot more about it, and um, it, it feels like when we kind of sweep it under the rug, nothing happens. We don't progress, right? It actually even harms us a little bit more when we don't uh, uh, focus on these things and talk about these things. Absolutely, I think you know the conversations we have about health, whether it's physical health or mental health, and the more that we educate ourselves and learn about it, then the better off we'll all be. Good. So now you mentioned this a little bit earlier. You wrote the article. Right, just you, you put it out there, it went viral. A, a ton of people reacted to it, a lot of people shared it. Um, from that article came the book. What, what was that transition like? When did you think, oh, there's actually an audience for this, and I'm gonna put more information out, uh, out about it? What was that? What was that process like? Oh, so yeah, I was a therapist and I only wrote articles sort of on the side. It was my side hustle. My husband had passed away a few years before and I was looking for a way to earn just some, a little bit of extra money. And so I would write a few articles here and there. And uh, when I wrote the 13 things mentally strong people don't do, I was actually in a really low place in my own life. I had, was going through um, some grief and some hard times and it was a letter to myself. So I published it online, and a lot of the other articles I'd written were sort of sterile, and they were more um, research-based. And this one I, I put out there just based on the things that I had learned throughout my, my own series of losses, as well as through being a therapist. And I stepped away from my computer thinking, ah, maybe if it's helpful to me, it will help somebody else. But it immediately went viral. It shut down the websites that it was placed on, and before I knew it, Forbes picked it up, and Fox News was calling for an interview. Oh, and nice. Uh, yeah, and so it, it was read by a couple of million people within a, just a couple of days, but it just kept spiraling, and I was seeing all these celebrities retweeting it and being shared on Facebook, and then um, a literary agent called me and said, you should write a book, and I didn't even know what a literary agent was. I had never really thought about writing a book, and so I said, okay, thanks for calling, And but I was getting lots and lots of offers from people who wanted me to pay them $10,000, and they'd build a course for me, or to give them twenty grand, and they would write an ebook for me or so I she sort of got lost in the shuffle of all those other offers and a lot of them were uh, scams or people looking to take uh, advantage of what I had going on and so um, fortunately she followed back up with me and said no you should really write a book and I happened to be going to New York the next day to do an on-camera interview with Fox News in the on-camera interview with Forbes and I met with her and realized, oh, she's serious. I saw her office with all the uh, <laughs> books and other authors that she represented. And I thought, okay, this is the real deal. And, but I still questioned her. I kept thinking, are you sure somebody's going to want to pick this up? And she kept saying, yes, I'm positive that we'll get you a book deal. But I didn't tell her the backstory. I didn't tell her that my mother had passed away and then my husband and then my father-in-law and that, that it was really a letter to myself until a little bit later on. And I said, but I don't know if I want to tell my story. I'm a therapist. I listen to people's stories. I don't necessarily put my own story out there. And she said, well, it's up to you if you want to do it or not. But ultimately, it, it may be helpful. And so within a couple of weeks, we put together this book proposal. And uh, within days, we were flooded with 
offers from publishing houses. It was sort of like everybody's dream that you would put it out there. And before you know it, the offers are coming in from all directions. And, um, and then they were all bidding against each other. It was amazing. And so within a month and a half of between when I wrote the article, I had a book deal with HarperCollins. What, that's fast. What, what was that like? Right. I mean, you, you didn't set it out was, to, to write this book and now here are real serious people and, and, and publishing houses kind of fighting for you. What, what was that like? It was a complete whirlwind. I, it was never anything I would have imagined. And so before I knew it, you know, they were, we were fielding the offers and then certain publishers wanted to set up phone calls and they were talking to me and I was so nervous to, to get on the phone. I thought, I don't know what to say. I, I'm just a therapist who had these certain things happen in my life, but I'm not an author. <laughs> I don't know if I know how to write a book. And um, it, it was a really surreal time. And then in the meantime, all these other uh, news outlets were calling me. And by the time we got to deal with Harper Collins, they were telling me, you have to get out of the news because we don't want everybody to have heard your story so many yeah. times before the book comes out. And I thought, how on earth did this come to be in my life that suddenly I have Harper Collins telling me to, to limit the interviews that You're I'm too doing. Popular. Knock it off. Um, <laughs> right. And so then it was a matter of thinking, okay, but I had an article that went viral, but are people actually going to read the book? Am I going to be able to, to drum up interest for the book? So certainly that uh, fear started to set in. And then uh, we set a, a date to say, let's have the book done by June and it's going to hit the shelves in December. So really that whole next year was a, a, a whirlwind of things that I'd never imagined or planned on. And it was well received. The book. It was. I, yeah. And it was well received around the world. We're in 30 languages now and it's hit the wall street journal, the USA today, bestseller list, and it's hit bestseller list in, in other countries too. And I think, is this really my life now that I've written a book and that people are actually reading the book? <laughs> Let, let's talk about, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, the second book here in just a sec, but uh, you are, you're an author, right? I mean, you're, you're writing these books, you, a lot of media appearances, podcasting, you're on stage, you're talking about this stuff. Um, what percentage of time are you spending on that part of the career as opposed to uh, more on the clinical side? Um, I took a break from the clinical side. I, I waited a long time because I thought, okay, I, I wrote the book and the book came out and I was sort of thinking, all right, I'm a therapist who wrote one book and that's great. But for all I knew, nobody was going to buy it. So I didn't, wasn't quite ready to quit my day job yet. But at some point in my career, I thought, okay, people are now starting to talk about what's your next book. And, but it's really hard to get a second book deal. It's hard to get the first book deal, but to convince a publisher that you should write a second book is even more difficult, especially a spinoff. And so I had approached my publisher and said, Everybody keeps asking me now about how to teach mental strength to kids. What do you think about that? And they were on board with the parenting book. And so around that time, I thought, okay, I'll take a break from doing therapy to really focus on this and to grow this. And as long as people want to keep hearing about mental strength and I am able to talk about it on a, such a large scale, I don't know that it makes sense to sit in an office and do it one-on-one -on -one, uh, for right now. So I always hold it open that I can go back to that whenever I want, but for right now, I'm really focusing on, on writing and speaking and uh, an online course and really just spreading the word, the word on mental strength as big as I can. Yeah. So other than right sitting in your, in your boat, living the good life, what, what does your day to day look like right now trying to build this? I mean, it's, there's no structure to it. It feels like, right. You, you're in charge of, of this. So what are you doing on, on a regular basis? And is it fun and easy for you? Yes, it is fun. And it's, <laughs> I wouldn't say easy. There's days that are more challenging than others, but it's, it's so much fun that I love the challenges. So I write for uh, a lot of magazines. I write for Forbes and I write for Inc. And I write for a website called Very Well. So I'm always writing, whether it's articles or uh, coming up with some content for, uh, for some other project that I'm working on. Um, and I'm working on my third book, actually. My third book will be the 13 things mentally strong women don't do nice. and that's due in the beginning of may so i'm frantically finishing that one up it's almost done and that'll come out next january so between that and marketing book number two and working on book number three and writing articles that takes up a lot of my time and then speaking engagements and traveling my schedule's pretty full good for you 
Congratulations. That's, that's uh, again, a, a lot of people's uh, vision of success and, and what they want to be doing because obviously you're passionate about this and, and you're making it happen. So, again, congratulations. Now, let, let's talk about the second book. We, we kind of have mentioned a little bit, but 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do. Um, was that as easy for you to, uh, to produce as, as the first book? It was actually easier, I think, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I, I knew how to write a book, at least by the time I wrote the second one. So I was familiar with the process, so I could kind of work my way backwards from what I knew the big picture was going to be. And as a therapist, I had spent a lot of my career concentrating on kids I had worked with uh, kids with depression, anxiety, and behavior disorders. That was one of my specialties. And so I had plenty of case studies and stories, and I had run parenting groups, and I had also been a therapeutic foster parent. And so I could say, you know, not only do these things work in my therapy office, but I use them in my own home with some of the kids who have the biggest behavior problems, the kids who were kicked out of every other placement they'd ever been in. So I know that this stuff works. And, and so for those reasons, actually for this book, I had way too much content. We had to cut quite a bit of it out because I could have just kept talking forever mm. about it. And uh, I had, I had a little bit longer of a time period to write this one. The first one we were working so hard on getting it, um, out to the shelves as fast as we could that I didn't have as much time, but for this book, I had a lot longer too. So it made the writing process easier. And, and so, uh, you know, when I look at this, um, I see the don't do. This could have easily been uh, been books on, you know, thirteen things mentally strong people do. Why why the don't? And I like that twist there. I think there's so much advice out there about you should do this and you should develop that good habit and here's ten other things you should be doing, and that's great and good habits in our life are really important. But sometimes it just takes one or two bad habits to keep you stuck, and. In my therapy office over the years, I would see that some people were much more resilient than others. And and sometimes people would go through incredible, difficult circumstances, and yet they would bounce back. And I would try to figure out, well, what's the difference? And as a therapist, I was taught to really build on people's strengths, identify what they're already doing well, and tell them to keep doing that. But then I realized I'm kind of doing these people a disservice because sometimes it doesn't necessarily seem to be about what these people are doing. It's also about those bad habits that are counteracting all their good habits. So they're like a hamster on a hamster wheel going as fast as they can, trying to build all these good habits. But until they give up one or two of those bad habits, they're never actually getting anywhere. And so then I realized that. And then in my own life, when I was going through tough times, I just really wanted to remind myself, no matter what you do today, just don't do these certain things. And if we equated it again to like physical health, well, maybe I'd go to the gym and I'd work out on the treadmill. But if nobody tells me, hey, by the way, you also shouldn't eat a dozen donuts every day, (laughs) well, then all my work on the treadmill isn't going to be effective. And I'm a big believer in working smarter rather than just harder. And so, you know, you got to get rid of the, you got to change your diet, get rid of those dozen donuts if you want your workouts to be effective. And the same is with mental strength. If you want your mental strength workouts to be effective, just get rid of these bad habits and life will look a lot clearer, a lot different, and you'll be much more effective. And it makes sense, right? And like you mentioned, there are so many different reasons or so many different books and, and, and columns and things like that about what we need to be doing, where we kind of get lost in the shuffle and we feel overwhelmed. I can definitely get behind something that I should stop or not do uh, a whole lot easier. It kind of sticks out a little bit more in, in my head. So um, it, it works. And obviously, people are responding well to it. And um, you are exactly where you need to be right now with, with trying to get this message out. I think so. I have had so many people that will say, you know, gosh, that just really simplified things for me to think about what not to do. Or I realized I had just one or two re- really bad habits, but now that I'm giving those up, my life is changing and I'm starting to see results. So I'm so excited that people are applying it to their lives. And then I get flooded with emails from people who are saying, this is working. It's changing my life. And thank you so much. And it just makes it all so worthwhile. You know, we, we uh, those that are listening, right, they, they are uh, probably going to pick up the book. They're going to read your articles, those, those type of things. And so they're looking at you as a success, uh, somebody that's following their passion. A lot of our audience are entrepreneurs, right? They're, they're in the trenches building their own companies or, or products or whatever. Um, and, and so they're looking at you thinking, yeah, that things are lining up. Things are going great. But there's been um, um, some, some setbacks and some difficult parts. What has been the, the toughest part of all of this right now? 
I guess one of the toughest parts is sort of figuring out when um, to put the brakes on. Uh, I do a lot of the work myself. I don't have a large team of people or anything like that. And so figuring out, okay, how do you make the website? How do you update this? And where do you want to advertise? And how do you do stuff for social media? And so I could easily work 24 seven and, and still not feel like I was doing enough. So really putting limits on how much I work, how much time I invest in things, because it's easy to look over at other authors who are out there and they're doing wonderful things. And then to wonder, should I be doing that? Or should I keep changing courses? And it took me a while, too. I got so much advice from seasoned authors and speakers who would tell me, no, this is what you should be doing. And for a while, I, I, and I kept hearing different bits and pieces of advice or people were doing completely different things. And then I realized, okay, I have to come up with my own business plan and it's my own path. And my journey is going to look a little bit different. So even though somebody might have this piece of advice about what worked for them, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for my business. And once I figured that out, things became a little bit clearer, but I still have to make sure that I'm putting limits on how much I work or that I'm not just chasing the things other people are doing too, to try to get the same results that they have. It's tough, right? For entrepreneurs, we, we get so, there are so many different options, so many different ways that we can kind of uh, uh, go, right? There's a lot of different paths. Uh, yeah. And, and kind of figuring out, Hey, I need to focus. I need to do one thing right. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. That, that can be challenging for us for sure. Now uh, you, you mentioned, um, being uh, out there doing your thing is on stage with the books. Um, you also have a course. Let's think about the course a little bit. What is that like? Who is it for? So the course is really, it's appropriate for somebody who's read the book, but it can also be helpful for somebody who, who hasn't read the book. I definitely meet a lot of people who say, I just don't sit and read books anymore, oh. but they're willing to take an online course. So it's, uh, it's self-paced and it has some short videos, not long lectures or anything like that, but short videos and there's a workbook and then there's experiential exercises. And the goal is to help people build a, a plan for how do you build mental strength in your own life and what types of things do you need to give up? What kinds of exercises do you want to start practicing regularly? How do you change the way that you think? How do you identify the core beliefs in your life that are holding you back? And how do you create positive change? And, and then how do you keep going from there? So it's really a, interactive, but yet at the same time, people can can do it one step at a time. If it takes you three days to do it, great. But if it takes you three years to do it, that's fine too. You get lifetime access to it. And, and uh, I'm really hoping that it really helps people to, to just keep building. We have students from, I think, 52 countries who wow. take it. And I'm just so excited that people from all around the world who uh, didn't know about mental strength are now doing this and building their own mental fitness plans to say, to come up with how do you build your, your own mental muscles and what's going to work for you. Right, so you're building your your empire on something that's needed, right? It's not like you're selling us uh, shiny shoes that's, you know, whatever, right? We'll, we'll get rid of it in, in less than a year. This is something that, that can actually change people's lives. You're passionate about it. You're an expert in it. Uh, that, must, that must feel good, right? But at the end of the day, with all of the success that you're having uh, on top of this, What's the one thing that's keeping you up at night? What, what, what are you thinking about? What are you worrying about? Hmm. If anything. Right? I guess, you know, there's, yeah, I, fortunately, I don't have too many fears. I guess when I go to sleep, I'm always thinking, okay, what, do I, what am I going to do tomorrow? And I'm excited to wake up in the morning. Nice. But there's also that thought of, you know, this, this happened to me when it wasn't planned. So sort of when is it going to end? How much longer are people going to be this interested in talking about mental strength? And I'm, I'm hoping it, it just keeps going and building from here. But of course, there's always that fear of, I don't know, are people going to say, okay, we've, we've heard it enough? Or yeah. are they still going to be interested? But it seems like you're you're keeping up, right? You're, you're continuing to do more books and the courses, and I'm assuming that your your speaking and your definitely your articles are continuing to kind of uh, keep up, or at least keeping us thinking about these different type of uh, things and angles on on mental health and and all of the different things that you're talking about. Um, so so we love it, right? Now as we start to wind down a little bit, uh, wrap this up a little bit, uh, a couple more questions. What's the single biggest reason for your success? It was I fast, think, somewhat unexpected th this quickly, but, but what has it been? I, you know, I think hard work. Um, and I don't, I'm not one of those people that says you need to hustle 24-7, seven days a week. <laughs> but 
uh, I think to, to figure out, okay, if I had an article that was successful, uh, how do you then capitalize on it and how do you build a business out of that? Um, and so I definitely worked, I studied, I did everything I could to learn. I knew nothing about publishing. I knew nothing about creating an online course or speaking. So I hired a, you know, a coach for certain things when I didn't know what I was doing and really just invested and said, okay, how am I going to do this? And, um, how do I stay focused and how do I, uh, work as hard as I can? So there's certainly some luck involved in having a viral article, but I think, um, I could have easily had that article and then not been able to turn it into a business. So the hard work came after with figuring out how do I, how do I make this something that I can keep building on? Uh, I love it. And when we have you back on the show in three years, uh, what are we going to be talking about? Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully we'll still just be talking about, um, more books and more <laughs> opportunities to keep teaching people. You know, I'd love to someday have something that schools could use to start teaching it to kids. Uh, that would be one of my long-term dreams to say, okay, how do we teach this on a global scale to, to kids? It's so important. Okay. It, w which is right. I think where we need to be, right? If we can kind of address this early on, it's going to be, uh, not only beneficial for those that are that are learning, but for society in general, it, it feels like. Uh, so good, we're we're right behind you. We're going to be rooting for you all all the um, for with everything that you're putting out there. So congratulations again. Now, for those that are interested in the books, in the course, uh, or just want to follow you online, where can we find you? And the best place is my website, which is Amy Morin M O R I N L C S W is in licensed clinical social worker dot com. Perfect. So outliers, you can go to outlierhq.com. That's outlierhq.com. First of all, subscribe to the podcast, rate, review it, share it with your friends. Uh, but there you're going to find Amy's website, links to social media accounts, links to her books, the course. Obviously, she's a real deal. Reach out to her. She's doing some amazing things. Uh, you can learn from her. Uh, Amy, this has been fun. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, your words of wisdom, and just this your story. It's been uh, It's very inspirational. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for letting me share it with you. Perfect. Uh, Outliers, we'll talk to you next week.